we do. Okay, great, perfect. Uh, okay. But it's not, uh, sorry, it's not uh, uh, full, full screen. screen. I don't know yeah, if I try that's to, the aim. I try to, I try to, but Teams doesn't let me. Um, ah, so okay. I, I just tried to. Um, okay, that's I, fine. Yeah, I think it will be fine. Um, okay, everything will be visible anyway. Okay, I'm very happy to be here. And thank you for the kind words, actually, Hamid. That was very nice. Um, so as Hamid said, my, all my research is about ESG measurement and the impact in the end of ESG ratings on, on not only stock returns, but also on companies um, and the real world. Um, yeah, and so we started actually, I did my, actually my PhD in France, um, in Paris, Paris Dauphine. Um, that was a while ago, and it was, I started 10 years ago. Um, and also, could please, could everyone mute himself? That would be great, because I have a lot of noise. Thank you. Um, yeah, I started my PhD 10 years ago in, in Paris, um, and it was a, an in industry PhD with Amundi Asset Management, and at the time, not, they didn't have a lot of ESG um, assets under management, but we increased, increased actually, um, while I was working there, we went from one or two billion to almost 60 billion in four years. So that was really the start of um, ESG. And yeah, and I worked in the quant team. And so before, and I wanted to write a PhD, so I reached out to supervisors and nine out of 10 supervisors said, no, also, if you work on ESG and sustainable investing, that will be the end of your career. You basically end your career before this has started. And yes. It was really hard to publish at the time. It was really complicated. But as you see now, there's a lot more interest. And um, at the time of my PhD, I was more focused on the link of um, sustainable performance and, and, and stock performance. But when I joined actually MIT um, with Roberto Vigobon, um, the professor I'm working with, and um, also Julian Kerber, we thought about actually taking a step back, and this is actually looking at the ESG data, because there was not much research about it. And the first thing we saw, there was a lot of confusion, because there was a lot of disagreement between different ESG raters, and also there are a lot of raw data that was in aggregate. And so hence the name aggregate confusion, and the paper is called the divergence of ESG ratings, and it's jointly written with Roberto Rigo one and Julian Kerber. And here is just an example of this confusion that we saw. <clears throat> On the right hand is the, the, um, the top 10 companies in our sample, or top 5% in our sample, um, where the disagreement is the most. And you see the dots are all over. It's all about, it, the, the ratings are normalized. So this is expressed in standard deviations. And so you see that there's, <clears throat> it's fairly common in this plot that you have a four standard deviation, deviation difference. That is massive. Um, on the left hand side, you actually have, have the companies where raters agree the most. And you see there's still some disagreement, like one standard deviation is normal. Um, <clears throat> so what's so interesting is when you look at the right and the left hand side, we analyzed those companies, why they disagree, and we couldn't really explain why. You have big companies in on both sides. You have on the left hand side, you have Apple. These G raters seem to agree there. On the right hand side, you have Barrett Gold, AT&T, Bank of America. Um, so yeah, it was really hard for us to actually understand this disagreement where it comes from. So <clears throat> that's why we what we set out to explain. But let me take a step back <clears throat> and give you just an overview of what actually needs G rating is. And <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> it is early in the morning here. In the end, um, so in the in the middle, as you see, those the white um, circles are for us attributes, and they are theoretical. That would be like the true performance of the, of an indicator, um, such as discrimination, diversity, CO two emissions. And that then will be assessed, and those ESG raters will create an indicator. So they will measure this attribute and will create an indicator. And those are the circles with the eye. Those then are actually, those indicators aggregate to a rating R1 and to a rating R2. This is the final rating. So what you see here is actually that, um, please could yourself 
Thank you. Um, so what you actually see is that um, there is for sure um, a scope diver, what we call a scope divergence. So not all raters assess all attributes. Um, you see rater A, rater one actually assesses attribute one, two, three, and A attribute N, but not attribute four, whereas rater two actually assesses um, attribute four. So there is scope diversion. There's also um, what I said, aggregation. So there's um, there will be a weight divergence because um, different indicators have a different weight in an uh, in a in an ESD rating, and also there will be measurement by divergence because both raters try to assess the same attribute, but they will come to different conclusions because they will have different methodologies, and they most likely will also have different input. And as you can see, there's already a lot of confusion now and aggregation. So let's look at the correlations. Um, that is a little bit like the first graph, but um, expressed mathematically. And as you see, correlations range from minus one to one. And as you see for the ESG score in our sample, those are pairwise correlations between six raters, so all the combinations. And you see there, in the first line, they range from um, 42 over to 71% um, and then even the lowest is 38% and the average is 54%. So they're somewhat correlated. Some are even more correlated than others, but there's also some that are not that much correlated, which is interesting when you then split it up to E, S and G, because all those ratings have also E, S and G ratings. Um, and the dimensions, the disagreement becomes even stronger, especially for the governance dimension. It's 30% the, on average, the correlation. And this is actually a pattern that you see also in a lot of other different um, um, academic studies that E actually has the most agreement, S um, is in the middle and G the lowest. So um, as I said, a lot of those raters have um, all those raters have different indicators, and that can range from 38 for Moody's to up to 282 for Refinitiv. Um, and so we needed actually a common language to make them to map them, um, so that we actually, or what we call, we call it a taxonomy, because. They are actually, as you see here in this example, for we take um, the example for water. This is one um, one category out of our mapping. Refinitiv here has three different um, indicators: discharge into water system, water recycling, and water use. KLD has water management and water stress. MCI calls it water stress management. S&P Global calls it water operations, water related risks. Um, Moody just calls it water. So we had to actually make sure that we can actually, yeah, we can match them uh, or map on map them onto each other. And um, I'm sorry, uh, Florian. So these yeah. these also changes over time and uh, the the categories or sort of they are fixed. They do. They uh -huh. do. They do change over time. The so that our study is done in two, 2014 and in 2017 um, because. But they do change over time because methodologies change over time. Refinitiv had um, between 2010 and now they had two big uh, methodology changes. KLD or okay, KKLD had also one big methodology change in 2014. MSCI had two big um, methodology change where we actually, so for example, MSCI had that in between two, 2014 and 2017. So we have actually we created two taxonomies for that. Yeah, that's very. That's a very important question. Thank you for the clarification. And so now we actually have, we create 64 categories for um, in total. And the way we do it is that we, um, we create a category whenever there is um, at least two raters have um, similar indicators, we create a category for this matching. Total 64. And since we have now a common language, we can actually now analyze that we can go a little bit deeper. We can analyze that, um, that data. So 
Um, let me take a step back. So now we, I told you we have, I, I showed you on how, when I explained how there are, um, how ESG ratings are constructed, that there are actually um, naturally three sources of disagreement that can arise with those ESG ratings. And the first is scope. So which attributes do I include? What do I measure? For example, I am, I am German and in Germany we care a lot about electrosmog. So a natural attribute I would include and I would measure would be electromagnetic field radiation. Um, in France and especially in the US, people care less about that because it's less part of the, of the discussion of the public debate. So that would be a natural um, divergence. And for France, for example, you, um, there's a rater that was bought by Moody's, Bijou Iris, and you can still see when you look at the methodology that it's heavily um, focused on labor rights, human rights. Um, and so there's also a natural reason why actually there's scope divergence. Then we have weights divergence. Weights divergence. Weights divergence happens because you give a you, you raters give a different relative importance to each of the indicators. Climate change nowadays is much more important, um, for example, than probably electric magnetic fields for a German rater because it's such a big topic. Um, so there's also a natural source of divergence. Um, and the last one is measurement. As I said, we have this theoretical attribute, so we want to measure, for example, climate change risks, but then we use different. Yes. Uh, it should be probably back. Hopefully. So guys, the idea is that let me now teach a little bit. Uh, so the idea is that you it's also relevant for you guys because you want to look at let's say uh, e, e s g ratings nowadays is a big deal and you want to see you know let's say to the extent that even you believe that it's going to uh, to have an effect you know if you have a, a high uh, you know, more risk, purposeful company it may have higher value uh, but then you need to rely on something uh, which you have to rely on ESG, let's say rating. If you want to take those, you, there are divergence and you know how you, you interpret those, etc. Florian, you, you are with us again? Yes, I am. I don't know what happened. The internet connection was stable. It still worked, but it um, yeah, just kicked me out. So you all were all in there. Okay, so <laughs> I was the only one that got kicked out. That's sad. Yes. Um, OK, but that's OK. Um, so I stopped with measurement. So now we actually, um, since we have this common language between those raters, this mapping, and we know that we talked a little bit about the sources of divergence, scope, weights, and measurement. So scope was, do I measure something? Weights was, how relatively important is um, an indicator? And measurement is, um, what is my measurement methodology? And um, what data do I use to assess an indicator? So now we can actually, with this with this mapping, we can actually look at um, <clears throat> the first the the the, the, the what we in, in the end find the biggest source of um, divergence measurement, and that is a simple way of doing this is just at looking <clears throat> again at pairwise correlations between the categories uh, for, for for each category between the raters. And here is actually this table is doesn't have the 64 categories because it would be impossible to show. So I'm showing you the robustness check using SASV categories. Just for presentation purposes. And what you see here is that um, 
yeah, it's yeah, all over the place. Excuse me, Florian, just for a clarification for students. So the, on the top, so these are each two pairs of uh, raters, ah, okay. right? Yeah, exactly. So you have here KLD Sustainalytics, KLD Moody's, KLD um, S&P Global. Do you see my mouse? Yeah, great. So you have KLD Refinitiv, you have KLD MCI, you have K Sustainalytics Moody's. So it's always pairwise correlations. Just a very simple um, um, comparison. And on the left, you have the categories. So for example, here you have um, its excess and affordability or the correlation for KLD and Sustainalytics, and it's 41%. So what you here see is that the correlations are actually all over the place on the category level. They range from 76, 80% here between KLD and MSCI to minus 50% between KLD and Sustainalytics for selling practice and product labeling. So selling practices and product labeling is actually responsible marketing. Responsible marketing would be, um, do you advertise tobacco um, for and target young people? Um, that would be irresponsible marketing, for example. And it's really fascinating that KLD thinks this company does great in terms of responsive marketing and Sustainalytics thinks they do actually um, very badly. So yeah, it was for me, it was surprising. So actually I went, I, I checked this number five times at least because it couldn't explain um, to myself. So the interesting part here is also KLD and MSCI, MSCI bought KLD and then um, kind of merged internally. We included still KLD because it's a very important rating in academia. But for investors at already at the time when we did the study, it wasn't that important anymore. So it's actually good to see that they correlate fairly highly compared to the others. And it's also a special case to be highlighted. So you see there's measurement divergence everywhere. No, there's never a perfect agreement. And to make it even worse, there's actually one indicator that should be unambiguous. And that is the signature of the UN Global Compact. Um, we have that in our paper, and the, even there, the correlation is only 92% between Sustainalytics and Refinitiv. It should be 100% because there's a database where you can easily access when the company signed the global compact, and so you shouldn't make any mistake. And so I went actually into both databases, and I really realized that both databases actually make mistakes. And I will talk about exactly that indicator later in, when I'm talking about a different paper. And I'll explain what happened there actually. But so there is fundamentally, there's a big, um, there is a lot of measurement disagreement divergence going on here. On um, what you also see there are blank fields. That means at least one of those, because it's a pairwise comparison, there's at least one of the raters doesn't have an indicator in that category. And that is what we call scope divergence. So you see there are two sources of divergence already seen just in this, um, this slide. The next slide, um, we're looking at weights divergence. And the way we did it actually is we did a reverse engineering. So we used, for example, the Sustainalytics score, the ESG score, and regressed it on its own um, indicator data, but through the lens of our taxonomy through the lens of our categories. And uh, by that, we can then actually compare the coefficients of that regression and see that they are actually different between raters. For example, here for um, customer welfare, you have 0.131 for Sustainalytics and 0.072 for S&P Global. Um, so that means those the weights um, for the aggregation diverge. It's also interesting, this is actually also an interesting exercise because it is kind of a robustness check if this taxonomy, this categorization is actually a valid construct. Because you could think that um, by, by, by using it through the lens of our, this, this taxonomy, you would, destroy, um, you would destroy data, you would destroy information. Because here we also don't use any industry fixed effects, or we do not use any industry information in this regression. And all those rates told us very explicitly that the weights depend 
on the industry. But de facto, without that information, we can actually quite, with a linear regression, we can quite accurate, accurately reproduce their own ESG rating. And the R squared ranges from 87% for Sustainalytics to 98% for S&P Global. The only way, one that's a little bit different is MSCI is 76%. When you hear, when you zoom into then, for example, in a sector or in an industry such as banking and finance, then it goes up to almost 100%. So MSCI depends, has more um, industry dependent weights than any other rater. So the two things that we can say from this slide is there's certainly weight divergence and there's also our categorization is a valid construct. Then we have an, we come up with a certain algorithm um, and a couple of regressions in that algorithm, which I will not um, explain further here, but I invite you to read the paper as it's very well explained there. And because what we wanted to do is we wanted to really explain what of those three sources of divergence contributes or how much each of those sources of divergence contributes to the total divergence. And we find that measurement has the biggest contribution to the overall um, divergence, 56%. Whereas scope is only at 38% and um, weights is at 6%. So you see that it also changes a little bit between raters. Um, <clears throat> but it is roughly actually um, measurement is almost everywhere the biggest source of divergence. And this will have um, some implications that I will explain um, in a couple of minutes. So again, measurement, more biggest source of divergence followed by scope and then weights. Um, yeah, so the fact that we find actually um, that this ESG measurement is the biggest source of divergence means also that we don't know how to measure certain, those indicators or ESG ratings perfectly. And that intuitively makes sense, right? How would you measure discrimination in the workforce? I mean, if you really want to measure perfect, perfectly, you would put um, sensors on every, every person and then you would use some machine learning algorithm and you would measure every action and in, every interaction and non-interaction in the company between people. Every call, every mail you have to analyze. That also creates obviously privacy concerns. So here we don't even want to measure it perfectly, right? Um, and so this, this actually, so this measurement error um, creates problems, um, especially in, in the setting of academic research, where we often um, use regressions to analyze the impact of ESG ratings on stock return. And so what we do is we, we regress stock return on ESG ratings with a couple of control variables, financial variables, um, to avoid omitted variable bias. Um, but here, with, if, the, if the ESG rating or the regressor has um, measurement noise, then this would be downward biased. And you, one way of explaining it is, if I do this, then you can barely hear me. And this is exactly like intuitively the same kind of thing with the regression that's happening, this measurement noise. So what did we do? First, the easy way of, oh, let me go back. So you don't get, you don't stare too much on the graph because it would be complicated enough to explain it. So what you would do is um, you would just take a simple average normally. That's what you probably learned in high school. Um, the problem here is though, that you can already intuitively feel that um, with ESG ratings, the noise, has different distributions or put differently, um, S&P Global sends out a questionnaire once a year to a company and tries to assess really the fundamental ESG performance of, um, of, of a company. And they only change the ratings once a year. True Value Labs, for example, another rate in our example, in our sample, changes its ratings every day by web scraping a lot of information everywhere. So, this reactivity, this increased reactivity from true value labs actually comes at the expense of measurement error. You, you intuitively feel already that this is a TVL 
True Value Labs is much, is much noisier than, than S&P Global. And so then an average is not the optimal way of looking at it, like of reducing the measurement error anymore. In, in the industry, something else is heavily used is a PCA, a principal component analysis. And we show in simulations that it's also suboptimal to use that. There's actually a better way of using it, uh, of doing, and that is using an instrumental variable regression. It's basically intuitively this again, the setting in academia where you regress stock return on these G ratings. But what you do before the, you have actually you, in, you do a step before. And that is you use your one ESG rating and you regress it on all the other ESG ratings that you have. And then you use the Y hat. So the forecasted value of the ESG rating and insert it in this asset pricing regression of stock return on ESG performance. And by doing so, you actually um, somewhat isolate what we would call um, the the true ESG performance. And now what you can do is to assess actually if this um, um, if this actually is a good framework or if this is a good statistical uh, model um, to use, you can actually compare the standard regression, so the ordinary least squares, with this instrumental variable regression. And this is what the NAGLEX graph does. You see that actually for eight different raters in four different regions here, you see coefficients for the OLS. So this is what actually um, normally when you read a paper um, about stock, uh, yeah, stock performance and, and ESG performance, when you read this, this is what normally what people run. If you use an instrumental variable regression and you try to control for that noise, you actually then become a, have this those coefficients. And as you can see, um, first of all, those actually there are very few with the OLS that are significant and um, with the instrumental variables so when you control for noise actually a lot more become um, statistically significant and they also go up so not the first one but here the second one for example goes up um, here this one goes up again um, this one goes up as well so um, wait so this one goes up um, this one goes up, this one goes up. So here, just in Europe, seven out of eight go up. So that shows us, yes, um, there is some downward bias happening. And here, this block actually shows us what um, what rating we used to um, denoise actually this rating here. And we see that for ISS, we used all the seven other ratings to your noise. There are certain tests that you have to run in order to use them and to um, to know that they are actually valid instruments. And we show that actually almost in all cases you, you use actually all the other ratings. There are very just very few cases where you exclude ratings. That means that even though here in in the setting that um, that the other ratings are actually all important because you can all use them. They're all so different in their methodology that we can all use them to actually reduce the measurement error in, in the rating on this side here. Was that clear, Hamid? Or do you have any questions? Yes, but it's... Uh, so the message is that basically uh, the, the ones with higher ESG ratings, if you measure it correctly with less noise, Companies with higher ESG ratings, they have higher future stock returns. Is that the the that agree? Yes, exactly. If you are better able to um, to identify the true ESG performance, then you have a better predictor of performance of uh, of of return. And that is actually um, that is a little bit the main message. Okay. So, and did you? I wonder if you also looked at the sub. Uh, categories or no, it was just the, the no, ESG only, as total. Only those because the paper is already very long. <laughs> so <laughs> we, 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 we run the same tests um, just to see. So you've seen the same pattern, but the paper is already horribly long. And I'm really sorry for that. Um, mm -hmm. But they are, it has a lot of graphs. So what we did actually now here is um, just an overview of what we find. 
and we have in total we estimate actually so what we also do is as a robustness check is um we don't only use the um the return